Hello and welcome to this edition of Quality of Life. I'm your host, Dave Augustine. Today we're going to talk about orthopedics and in particular the spine. Joining us to talk about this subject is from Lakeshore Orthopedics, Dr. Thomas Sylvester. Dr. Sylvester, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Um, just to start out with, um, what is your specialty in orthopedics? Uh, my specialty is orthopedic spine surgery. So um, although uh, while we're on call for orthopedics, we take care of any musculoskeletal injury, uh, my, my typical uh, practice is focused on uh, disorders of the spine. Okay. Now you're a board certified orthopedic surgeon, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. What do you have to do to become board certified as far as your educational background as you know, I'm sure hours of internship or residency, all that sure. kind of stuff? Um, I uh, started out in college. Uh, I got my degree in biology at Yale University, which was four years of college. Uh, after that, uh, medical school is another four years and I completed that at Rosalind Franklin in Chicago. And after uh, the four years of medical school, people specialize. Uh, my specialty, orthopedic surgery, is a five-year residency program. And I completed that residency program at Loyola University in uh, Maywood, Illinois. After uh, we finish our orthopedic residencies, we have the option of going into uh, orthopedic practice or subspecializing in one of the various uh, subspecialties of orthopedics, whether it be spine or hand or sports, foot and ankle, and that is an extra year of training. So I chose to do a spine surgery fellowship at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Okay, so do you just focus on spine surgeries that are referred to you, or do you also see patients and do the analysis first? Uh, my practice is both, actually. Both? Um, typically, um, we do uh, focus oftentimes on the surgical treatment of spine issues, uh, but the vast majority, thankfully for patients, um, mm -hmm. the vast majority of them that see us in the office don't necessarily need a surgery. Okay. How long have you been with Lakeshore Orthopedics? I've been with Lakeshore Orthopedics for a year and a half now. Oh, nice. Nice. Regarding the spine, just for our viewers, could you go into I mean, what purpose or function does the spine serve sure. the body? Um, the spine really serves a, uh, a number of purposes. Uh, number one, it's the basic architecture from, uh, for our entire body. Uh, to attach our limbs. So um, it's the base for our arms and legs, essentially. Um, the spine also, uh, it's not only the bony architecture of the spine as a spine surgeon that we concern ourselves with, it's also the, um, the contents of the spine. Mm -hmm. So the spinal cord and the nerves that travel through and exit the spine. Okay, and that all obviously attaches to the brain, so it's all related all together and functions as one almost. Correct? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely, okay. What are some of the conditions that you come across or experience in your care of patients? Sure. Um, the majority of patients, thankfully, that, uh, that we see for a back pain injury, most of them are, are strains or sprains. Mm -hmm. um, someone's overdone it, they have pulled a muscle in their low back or in their neck. Um, and are having pain from that. Uh, that. That's the vast majority of what spine injuries are. Some of the more, um, some of the more debilitating injuries that we'll see are uh, people that have uh, disc herniation. So the cushion that's in between the vertebrae, that's in between the bones of the spine, mm -hmm. When that becomes injured and protrudes, it can push on nerves causing pain into the arms or the legs or another part of the body. Uh, so that's another common problem. In terms of degenerative um, injuries, we'll often see types of, uh, uh, types of symptoms that are related more to arthritic type conditions. Mm -hmm. So just instead of a traumatic injury, a wear and tear of the spine, uh, just like knees and shoulders and hips uh, can become arthritic over time with use, same thing happens with our spine. Okay. For our viewers again, could you give us a kind of a summary or a generalization as far as what is arthritis? Sure. Um, arthritis is really uh, wear and tear. Um, when we talk about osteoarthritis mm -hmm. or the uh, more typical type of arthritis. And what happens is whether it's in the spine where there's a disc wearing out or some of the small joints in the spine wearing out or whether it's a, uh, a condition with a knee or an ankle or a hip, 
It's really the loss of cushioning between the bones, so bone spurs can form. Okay. There's narrowing of, of, of the spaces, and that can cause pressure on the nerves in, in the spine in particular. Okay. What are some of the diseases that can affect the spine nowadays? Um, well, we do oftentimes consider um, osteoarthritis or wear and tear mm -hmm. a, a disease, um, but more specifically, uh, we will see tumors of the spine. So whether people have a, uh, a tumor or a type of cancer that's begun in the spine, or whether it's a lung cancer or breast cancer or prostate cancer that's uh, unfortunately metastasized or moved mm -hmm. to the spine, that's a common issue. Um, disc herniations are things we worry about. In aging folks, uh, we worry about the loss of bone density and we'll see compression fractures. And all that is, unfortunately, is the result of osteoporosis, a loss of the firmness of the bone mm -hmm. and the bone gives way under, the, under pressure. Okay, what about scoliosis? Scoliosis is a, uh, fortunately, uh, not incredibly common, but but often enough seen by spine surgeons um, uh, condition. And scoliosis uh, in, in the most general terms just means curvature of the spine. Okay. So there are many different causes for uh, scoliosis. Um, when we see scoliosis in younger folks, um, in infants or in toddlers, it's often related to a, um, a genetic condition or sometimes a neuromuscular condition mm -hmm. where uh, the musculoskeletal system isn't forming properly. Um, that's not thankfully seen as often. In the adolescent uh, age group. So um, all of us probably have members of our family or we went to school with someone who had to wear a brace at mm -hmm. some time or had surgery. Um, that's typically what we call adolescent, uh, just meaning that age group. Mm -hmm. Idiopathic, meaning we don't know the specific cause sure. for it, scoliosis. And we know that there's a genetic component that is involved, but we don't have the genetics completely worked out. Um, those folks, thankfully, most times don't need surgery and are oftentimes treated well just with observation or with bracing. Brace. Unfortunately, some kids do need to go on to surgery. And then a, a third type of uh, scoliosis that we'll see is in the aging population or adult population. Mm -hmm. And when there's wear and tear on the spine, loss of disc height, the joints in the spine wear out, uh, degenerative arthritis is, or degenerative scoliosis is really just a, a form of arthritis. A curvature sure. occurs in the spine because one side wears out a little faster than the other. Now, by curvature of the spine, which way does it curve? Is that when you see your people like leaning forward with their necks down or does the spine actually go side to side? Or? The spine will, in, in scoliosis, so in adolescent scoliosis, uh, we know it's mostly a side to side okay. bending, but there's also a bit of a rotational component. So sometimes we'll see people that uh, are sent to us because in a school screening, um, they're asked to bend forward and the school nurse will see or the, the, the gym or PE coach mm -hmm. will see that uh, the patient has one shoulder blade higher than the other. Well, that can be seen in scoliosis because of some of that rotation that causes the ribs to rotate a bit. Wow. How about, you know, some people you see where they're hunched over or bent way over sure. and you can't straighten up. It's like you want to go over and just help them and straighten them up or, you know, brace their back, you know, to help it up. What's Absolutely. That? Um, that can be a number of things. Uh, in some folks, that is, uh, unfortunately, their posture from weak musculature or a type of injury over the years. Um, the term for a true hunching forward of the spine is kyphosis. And that can be, again, uh, similar to scoliosis, can be seen in a younger age population where it has a genetic component and that's just how the person is growing. Mm -hmm. um, it can also be seen in folks that have degenerative conditions of the spine or weakened bone where maybe they have had a compression fracture or multiple fractures and it's caused them to hunch forward because their spine is not able to support their weight. Okay. Can spine conditions, you know, develop, you know, with leaning forward or ever from their work environment or repetitive work, you know, if they're like, let's say at a desk job and they're always leaning forward looking at their desk or their papers or whatever, can that contribute to? It can certainly contribute to symptoms. Um, it often doesn't 
structurally injure the spine, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so we can see people that have muscle imbalances, tight muscles, um, weakened muscles uh, in the core and in the low back um, that can lead to symptoms. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, desk jobs don't necessarily uh, correlate to a specific injury. When we see work injuries, it's usually more of a physical type job. And that doesn't, that's not to say that mm -hmm. the other folks with office type jobs don't have pain, sure. but thankfully it doesn't often cause a structural problem. Okay. Now I know with the bones you have bone marrow. Is there bone marrow in the spine as well? Yes, absolutely. Wh what function does bone marrow uh, perform? Bo bone marrow really uh, is important in the early years in forming blood cells. Okay. Uh, so that's one of the main functions. Okay. Now also in the spine, you, know, you hear once in a while I'm talking about spinal fluid yes. or whatever. Is that the same thing or is spinal fluid something different? Spinal different? fluid is different. So the architecture of the spine is uh, really a, a column essentially of bone and disc, mm -hmm. bone and disc, with the disc being a soft material, um, cartilage type material. Sure. It's almost like a, a essentially like a cushion in a tennis shoe shock or a shoe or insert. Yep. That's exactly right. And it, it involves or allows for motion and shock absorption. Behind that column is a hollow tube. And that's where in the higher spine, in the neck and in the thoracic spine, mm -hmm. the rib cage area, that's where the spinal cord runs. And when we get down to the low back, the uh, nerves travel through that same area. So those nerves are contained in a sac that's full of spinal fluid. Okay. And that sac goes from the sacrum down near the tailbone mm -hmm. all the way up and is continuous with the covering around the brain. So the spinal fluid is the same fluid that's up around the brain. Oh, neat. That I didn't know. Um, you talked about tumors and obviously cancer. Well, you mm -hmm. know, and cancer metastasizes and everything. And a lot of times it goes to the major organs or the bone structure or the spine. What, what is that process happening or what is it that, how cancer forms in the bones or the spine? Sure. Typically, when we do see uh, cancer in the spine, the majority of those cases are metastasis. And all that means is that the cancer cells have moved from somewhere else in the body. Mm -hmm. Typically, what happens is there's a proliferation of those cancer cells in the primary tumor, whether it's lung cancer, mm -hmm. breast cancer, prostate cancer, and those get into the bloodstream and travel to the site where they then proliferate again and can cause a secondary tumor. Okay, interesting. So about back pain, what is the common type of back pain that people will have? Common type of, type of back pain that uh, we'll see most people for is sort of a, an acute back pain injury where they've had, um, say they're raking their leaves mm -hmm. or doing some yard work or carrying something up from the basement where they've just bent down the wrong way to pick something up or they've overdone it either in athletics or sometimes at their job or around the house. And those are typically the muscular type strains that we've talked about earlier. And those are usually injuries that are uh, fortunately self-limiting. Um, some of the common over-the-counter medications for pain and anti-inflammatory medications, uh, as well as heat and ice, stretching, things like that usually take care of, of those types of situations. So those would be your weekend warrior type situations, Absolutely. basically, as far Absolutely. as that goes. Uh, how does that differ with chronic back pain? Sure. Um, chronic back pain in its... Um, sort of in, in the symptoms people have can be very similar to those acute symptoms, um, but unfortunately they have lasted for months or even years in, at times for people. And oftentimes those injuries can be something much more structural as opposed to just a muscle strain or uh, a muscle or a, a ligament or tendinous injury. Oftentimes people with chronic back pain will have uh, the arthritis we talked about, sure. or a uh, long-standing disc problem that, that hasn't been treated. Okay. How about chiropractic care? Sure. Does that help with the spine in cases, or is it just a kind of a, he makes it better, but there's still an unmasked issue that's around? Chiropractic care uh, is excellent for a lot of patients, and um, for some patients, they unfortunately don't gain the relief they're looking for. Yeah. Um, but that's with 
all facets of medicine. Sure. That's also with spine surgery. Um, most, uh, most folks that I've come across in, in my office have, uh, that have worked with a chiropractor have uh, gained excellent relief. Um, unfortunately, uh, just like spine surgery, though, there are some things that are difficult to treat with chiropractic care mm -hmm. uh, and need a different, different direction. Sure. I know some, some people that I know use the inverted hanging devices where you strap your feet and you go on the yes. board and hang upside down. I mean, it seems to help some people also with theirs. It's probably the same thing where it's actually stretching out the spine. That's exactly right. Um, the inversion tables essentially uh, really negate the effects of gravity. So it, it's, it's reversing gravity. So instead of the pressure being uh, from the head down, it's really from the feet down and it allows the compressed discs to relax and to, to gain height again. So some people, again, mm -hmm. they find excellent relief with uh, inversion tables. As I know one friend of mine did that and he used the inversion table because he was scheduled for back surgery to go in and correct it. And when he came down for his appointment, he saw him walking around and we're not gonna touch you because of what the inverted table did. Absolutely. So that was kind of nice. What are some of the other home type remedies that people can do to help support good back? Sure. Um, proper lifting technique, uh, proper body mechanics, proper posture is very important. Anytime we're leaning over, bending at the waist forward to pick something up off of the floor or off of a, a, a low table, uh, probably a bad idea. We're really increasing the, the strain and the forces on the low back. Um, some of the things that people can do at home if they've had an injury to try to recover are heat and ice. Um, for, for initial injuries, mm -hmm. we usually recommend for 48 to 72 hours, people ice the injury to try to cut down on the inflammation. We know after that time sure. that some people do quite well with heat. Um, oftentimes people that have had an injury will uh, be seen by a chiropractor or a physical therapist and be started on a home stretching or exercise regimen. Uh, the vast majority of people do gain excellent relief with those modalities. <coughs> Excuse me, how about some over-the-counter drugs like aspirin, ibuprofen, or whatever sure. to help alleviate pain? Absolutely. Um, things like ibuprofen, naproxen, some of the uh, over-the-counter non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications are excellent for people that have had these uh, sort of, like you alluded to earlier, weekend warrior type mm -hmm. injuries, mm -hmm. the, the muscle strains and sprains. Um, it really helps to cut down on the inflammation in the area of the injury. Things like Tylenol, while not an anti-inflammatory, uh, work well as a, a, a pain relief medication um, and sometimes are used in, in conjunction with the, with the other medications. So the medications, would they help more with the muscular type strains and not the physical bone type strains or do they help with both? They actually help with both. Um, the anti-inflammatory effects that, that folks get with the ibuprofen or naproxen, um, they're often used not only for spine injuries or, or back pain, but for knee arthritis, shoulder mm -hmm. arthritis, other types of injuries as well. And we know that by cutting down on the inflammation, they work well as an arthritis type medication as well as a, an acute injury medication. Okay. So if I have a back pain that just won't go away or if I'm, what type of symptoms should I really look for when it comes to, you know, I have to go see a doctor about my, this because I just can't take it anymore. Sure. Um, the, the majority of symptoms that we worry about are things that um, really are suggesting a, a more serious injury than just a muscle strain. So, sp so pain that won't go away after a few weeks despite, mm -hmm. um, despite some uh, anti-inflammatory medications or Tylenol, a stretching program, um, heat and ice, um, any type of weakness into the extremities. So you're trying to get up the stairs and, you know, gosh, the leg just isn't under you. Mm -hmm. Any type of pain radiating into the arms or the legs associated with a back or a neck injury. Um, persistent pain just in that area, we worry, as someone had a fractured vertebrae. Um, any type of bowel or bladder issues or balance issues can be suggestive of uh, worrisome nerve compression mm -hmm. or spinal cord compression. I know um, when I was a kid, when I started hunting, I fell out of the tree. I was like 20 or 30 feet up and landed on right square in my back. 
you know, but I had all my heavy clothes on and everything, but it, it was great going down, but it wasn't when I hit, you know, but you could hear all the branches cracking or whatever. And um, I didn't really notice, yeah, I bruised some ribs and everything, but I really didn't notice the more chronic pain until I was, you know, probably five, six, seven years older. Is that a common case where, you know, you could sustain an injury, but you really don't feel the effects, you know, until later on in life? Absolutely. Um, traumatic injuries we know do, uh, in a lot of folks, accelerate that degenerative process. Even if there hasn't been a fracture or a frank disc herniation uh, with the injury, uh, we do know that oftentimes that that disc can be injured or the bone can be injured to the point that the normal aging process or the normal wear and tear process is accelerated by that injury. So uh, unfortunately, that's not an uncommon scenario. Okay. When do you feel when surgery is the last resort or versus you know, other types of treatment like physical therapy or whatever, when you determine, no, it's time to do surgery? Sure. Um, really, surgery should be the last resort for everyone. Um, when people have tried all of the other options, the chiropractic care, physical therapy, anti-inflammatory medications, um, sometimes people will undergo injections, different types of spinal injections um, that are essentially cortisone injections to try to relieve their pain or their symptoms. Um, that's really when surgery becomes an option. Um, more rarely uh, we'll see people with an acute injury uh, like a spine fracture that's unstable or if they have a, uh, a tumor or something mm -hmm. like that be that becomes more emergent that's uh, causing weakness or pressure on the spinal cord. Those become emergent surgery type situations. Okay. I know my grandma had a surgery with, on her back where they actually had to go in and make more room for the spinal cord because the spine itself was pinching in, mm -hmm. which she couldn't even walk. She was in so much pain, chiropractors didn't work. Could you go into, you know, in summary, what type, what really means with that surgery, what, what's all being done? Absolutely. So um, when we talked earlier about the, col the, mm -hmm. the column uh, arrangement of the spine, so behind the, uh, the bone in the discs is that, is that open column where the nerves run or the spinal cord sure. runs up higher. And that can become a narrow pipe essentially from bone spurs, from disc bulging, uh, just from wear and tear mm -hmm. quite honestly. And as that area narrows, it puts pressure on the nerves. And when there's pressure on the nerves, people have oftentimes leg symptoms that can be present all the time. It can be present just when they're up walking or standing or in certain positions. But really the way to alleviate the symptoms people are having is to open that area up again and to take the pressure off of the nerves. So for those types of surgeries, what we do is go in and open that column up. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's essentially a, uh, a plumbing job. Sure. We're taking a narrow pipe that's tightened or that's clogged and we're opening it up to take the pressure off of the nerves. Those types of surgeries are typically done through an incision in the back. Mm -hmm. We go through and take, um, take away uh, part of the offending bone and ligaments that are pushing on the nerves without necessarily destabilizing the spine and having to do any type of fusion type surgery. How has technology helped in performing these types of surgeries where before you know, you never even heard of it. Now they're going in on a regular basis and doing that, cleaning it all out, or fusing discs together and all of that. How has technology come forward to help Absolutely. with that? After the, over the years, um, all types of surgery have become much safer, uh, both because of surgical technique and because of anesthesia techniques. Specific to spine, in the last 10 or 15 years, though, there's been a, a big push towards um, minimally invasive surgery or less invasive sure. surgery. And it's really doing the same types of surgeries that were done traditionally, just through a slightly different technique where there can be a different approach used or different retractors or instruments used to make smaller incisions and to decrease the recovery time for patients, get them out of the hospital and functional much more quickly. So it's really, um, it's really all facets of medicine, but in spine surgery particularly, uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, the push towards minimally invasive surgery has really, uh, really improved a lot of people's lives. Nice. What are some of the risk factors that can contribute to back pain? Um, inactivity or overactivity. 
And when I see inactivity, um, being physically fit is quite important. Um, maintaining a healthy body weight uh, is important. Uh, we want to do enough activity that we're fit, but not be so overactive or have uh, such a, uh, a heavy workload mm -hmm. that we're injuring ourselves. Um, we know that smoking is a, uh, a, a huge, it has a huge negative impact with regard to spine conditions. Um, the types of soft tissues and the types of material that's in the soft tissues of the discs is similar to the types of soft tissues in our skin. Uh, and we know that that type of collagen is broken down by smoking. So that's mm -hmm. a huge factor for, for a lot of people. Um, posture is a big issue for people, uh, which goes towards um, physical mm -hmm. conditioning and strength of the abdominal muscles, the low back muscles. Uh, those are important aspects. If we're not fit around our core, we're really increasing the pressure on our spine and uh, not allowing our musculature to act as sort of a natural girdle. Okay. If I wanted to find out more about you know, the spine and its functions and some of the things that can happen to it, where would I go? Do you have a website or a number that can be called? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, our uh, practice's website is lakeshoreorthopedics.com and we also have uh, phone numbers for both our offices uh, in Sheboygan here on Taylor and in Manitowoc. Okay. Um, we have a couple of minutes left before we have to wrap. Any mm -hmm. final thoughts as far as the spine, the health of it, or advice to people on you know how often they should be checked or when they should be checked? Sure. Um, in terms of how often people should be checked, uh, thankfully there's been a big push uh, in schools over the last 20 to 30 years to do routine scoliosis checks. Uh, that has the, the early detection of scoliosis in younger folks um, has allowed early treatment with bracing and other techniques and has saved uh, thousands of people from, from surgeries that they otherwise would have needed with later diagnosis. In terms of the adult population, it's really and truly just making sure that we keep our uh, body weight at a reasonable uh, weight, making sure that we stay active and limber, uh, and uh, really just being sensible about the way we lift and perform our, our daily activities. Okay. Well, Dr. Sylvester, I'd like to thank you for appearing on the show and talking about this subject. I find it quite interesting. Great. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate your time. You bet. Um, this concludes our show on orthopedics and the spinal column. Um, if you care to find out more about this episode or have any other suggestions for episodes that you'd like to see, you can contact us through our website at www.wscssheboygan.com. Um, for Dr. Sylvester, Quality of Life, I'm Dave Augustine. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.